And the exposure of what happens. Um, if he was talking to us this morning about how she became an accidental writer, she was locked up for 30 hours in her father's study. And then she flipped that into an opportunity, read up, wrote, and then today she's a writer. So the exposure, negative or positive, is really lacking. That's the one leg. The third leg is about her potentials. The potentials of the average northern Nigerian woman, woman is beyond the skies. But there's no room for its expression. There is nobody harvesting or cultivating it. And even she lacks the knowledge or confidence to express it. Then within that, what happens, why she lacks that capacity is because her self-esteem, her self-worth is something she does not know. I keep telling my daughters and sisters that there is no price on this small head. Why? Because my antecedents are such that, and this is again what I come back to what Marie and if you were talking this morning, who was there with her in the beginning? Her father. Who is there to marry her up at the right age or the wrong age? Her father. So if you have a father like I had, who believed in me, who taught me to believe in myself, then your potentials will be in, and that's why I'm sitting where I am today. <laughs> now the fourth is contributions. Does she merit anything with all that education? Recently I was privileged to do a program design. We call it, um, uh, I think there's an Indian in the room, uh, uh, Barefoot College in India which trains non-lettered women. Now look at the IQ level of non-lettered women from communities across different regions that have suffered conflict. They are taught how to assemble solar panels, they are taught how to maintain them, and they are taught how to install them, install and maintain. So what it says to me, the average woman who has the responsibility of looking after her family, who is struggling to be a dignified citizen, if you give her the right exposure, the right opportunity, the right education, the sky. It's time for the very, you know, challenging situations that uh, affect yeah. and activity on your life. And that to me is what I call hope, the glimmer of hope that you give. Uh, I mean, she, 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 she doesn't sit down there and wonder in her, uh, um, in her situation. But in spite of the situation, she is able to stand up and still do something, no matter how small. And to me, that means that there is a potential there that can be, you know, unless to, to get the best that would uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, contribute to the development of our society. Now we'll come back. We're looking at basic things. We're looking at how to this particular thing, especially because they're situated within religion and culture, that socialize 
women in the way that their roles are defined and um, they are limited. Um, thank you, Katia. I think we reached um, hit rock bottom, you don't have a choice. Um, the evidence is clear. Um, you can see now, for example, the generation of girls that were deprived of education um, are now having to retrace, the parents are trying to retrace their steps. They need help. I think now many parents understand, or the girls themselves understand, women in the North understand that they've, they've been left behind, that there's a lot of catching up to do. Um, and so I think convincing them isn't going to be too much of a problem. The problem is the people we need to convince are the religious establishment and um, the, the traditional religious, just like um, Hadjia Saditu said, they just think um, it's, it's, it's a topic they're not comfortable with. They're not comfortable with letting go because they feel that, because they know the potential the woman has, um, if you empower her further, she already has her powers, you know women's powers. I think this is the psyche of a male, a northern man, is that women have powers already and you know what that means. So if you add that economic empowerment to that other power in the other room, I mean you have a very, very, <laughs> it's a combination, it's lethal. This is what they're afraid of. So I think... And, and I think we will maybe give men in the room a chance of us <laughs> to see whether they agree with your assessment. But, um, um, Mrs. Madi, I mean, again, that same question, because I think, you know, it's the kernel of the matter, particularly dealing with the first women that are going to fight this issue around socialization, culture, wrapped around um, um, and religion, and very sensitive areas that people often do that can't be really on. So, well, how do we begin to actually have this conversation and begin to address this particular issue? Thank you once more, Katrina, and um, I'm sure those of you who have heard my bio have seen that I work for an organization called Women's Rights Advancement and Protection Maternity Brother. Now, when I hear you say to challenge a construct, when I hear her also say to deconstruct, I feel we are beginning on the wrong foot. Already you have somebody who is up in arms, What we have learned in Rafa over the years, negotiating the rights of women, defending their rights in courts, defending their rights in criminal cases such as the Sharia cases of the Zillow in this country. You remember? Most of you will remember. What we came to learn is we needed to change nomenclature. That's the first step. Even as we speak, the nomenclature of equal opportunity is being grappled with in this country. Granted, arithmetic has always been a pro problem in Nigeria, where 17 is greater than 19. You remember all of them? Where 62 is the beginning of youth age. So arithmetic has always So let me ask you this. Yes. Is that perhaps it's a reason why the government is not going to be No, let me ask okay. you yes. In many ways, uh -huh. isn't this about pandering to prejudices and refusing to talk to what she does? I will tell you the story of my seven year old son when I started this job, women's rights activism in Nigeria. That's after I retired from service. He read one of our stickers where we said give women their rights. And he said to me, seven year old girl, Mama, will you give you rights? And I was wondering, where is he coming? So I put him by the ear and took him to his father's uh, uh, chair. I said, where is this coming from? He said, I don't know, it's in his blood. I said, we'll take it out. <laughs> now, what I'm saying here, is that it is an innate thing 
that the power dynamics, the power play between males and females, even when you look at animals at real, is the same thing. Secondly, I am not giving room for who does not like me to continue to dislike me. I'm giving room to the person who does not understand me, who has refused to see what God has endowed in me, who has also refused to harness the resources that God has placed in me. To I can't agree with you, Katrina. Everyone can go to the Rapa website, see what we have done and see what we are doing. Today in 2016, we have devised an, um, a hukba, which carries all the rights of women, which carries the responsibilities of men and women, which carries how marriages should be held, which even addresses the sole issue of Ijba. That is this right that fathers think they have to delegate their marriages or to marry off their young daughters. We have questioned it. Is it a force or a responsibility? And we have made that way. Okay, and I will, we will come back to those issues. No, I want, I want you to be this understand okay, that we have made a headway. Okay, we have understand. We have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have quite a bit to get through, so. <laughs> But, but um, sometimes, you know, when we have these conversations, we forget that the North is not monolithic. And we have different cultures and uh, religions. And even though there's a predominant, what is thought to be the predominant religion, there are people like Hawa who represent um, what we may call the mi minority in terms of faith and of women, uh, whether by way of, uh, like um, Haja Saudat Madi said, uh, changing or negotiating, uh, you know, these issues by, um, you know, giving it a different name or whatever, uh, for, for, for me, being a lawyer, I believe that another way is to challenge it. Another way of uh, I mean, uh, uh, addressing this issue is also to challenge, to stand up to it, you know. And um, irrespective of, uh, you know, whether Islam or Christianity or whatever, women's rights are universal irrespective of, uh, you know, where uh, you, you come from and which religion you believe. I, I mean, you belong to. Of course, we have the human rights instruments that, uh, you know, clarify that. Let me ask a quick question, not to take you off the board, but in your experience, both mm -hmm. of you, do, do you find that there's a, a different experience for a northern Christian girl as versus a northern Muslim girl in terms of sort of how they navigate society and the way they're treated by men and their communities? Yeah, I, I think they are, they are different, but they still, I mean, uh, in terms of, they are different in terms of maybe um, their, their, their circumstances, let me say. But the important thing is that whether Muslim or uh, Christian, women generally are, uh, uh, they are a, a, a marginalized group. Uh, for me, my experience is such that um, issues of women's rights are almost universal irrespective of the culture or religion because believe it all, whether as a Muslim or a Christian, is patriarchy. Secondly, I have no argument about the many multiple ways you can enter a room. But the important thing is to be in the room. Up until this, up until 2006, Rapa did not have the confidence to begin to discuss Islamic family rights in northern Nigeria. Why? Because of the same group.
And we had to really think through, get technical support in terms of even how we approach. And the major decision we took was, let us be in the room where we are to start with. Understand where they are coming from. And when we do that, and when I say negotiation, Kadria, Hawao, you know more than anybody in this room that I'm one to stand by what I believe in. But what I have come to learn, maybe with age and experience, is that I don't have to always fight. I can win the game without fighting. Let me bring in Aisha here. Um, we, we can win the game without fighting. What is um, your position regarding how we begin to navigate? I'm still at number one. The, the, the um, antecedents and the socialization of the female child in northern Nigeria. Okay, so um, I think first of all, let's go to the reason, the root of why are women not given the, the same rights? Why? Okay. Now we know that, like I said, there is an understanding, there's a feeling that um, if, if you don't marry a child early, uh, a girl, sorry, a child, child early, she doesn't go to school, or sorry, she goes to school, um, there's a danger that she will become promiscuous and there's a danger she will bring shame to the family and all that. That is the, the perception or the understanding of many northern traditional parents. Now, what has happened now over 15, 20, 20, 30 years is that we found, they have found, they can see that this actually, not taking them to school has actually made the problem worse. Um, the evidence, there's empirical evidence to show that. And why do I say that? Many parents are now faced with a situation where the same girls that they deprived an education, the same girls that they married off early, are now back doing the things that they need to do to keep the, to, to, to survive and for their children to survive. So parents are regretting it. They can see that if a woman, if she's widowed or divorced, or if a husband is out of work, and you know, of course, the recession in the last five years, you know what has happened now. A lot of men cannot even cope, you know, taking being the sole breadwinner. So what If you like, and I use the word prostitution, it's, it's more or less that. That's what a lot of girls are doing to, 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 to feed their families. And sometimes the parents know, even the husband knows he has to turn a blind eye. So I think we have enough evidence to prove to them, to convince them that, look, this way is not going to solve the problem. The problem is that from the beginning, you have to take them to school, do this, do that, so that they can now become eligible, go into the labor workforce, become productive, so that that problem will never arise where they have to use their bodies to be able to sustain themselves. Can I now, how, how do we popularize these negotiations that you talk about? Because, you know, we're sitting in a small room in Kaduna, there's not many of us. These problems are widespread. The North is big. So in practical terms, if we are looking to make changes that are widespread, that will lead to an um, impact on a sort of a substantial number of young girls in the north. Um, what do we need to do? The first is to, um, like um, my sister Lee, and his use of okay, thank you. Education, education, education for who first? Education for the parents. Before, before the doctors. Before the doctors. Education, not necessarily saying we are illiterate. I think we need literature. Mm. The limited understanding or exposure that refuses to allow themselves to be educated is also a helpful thing. In Kano State, mm -hmm. I was in a local government conversing for cultural education and violence against women. And one man said to me, look, I'm educated, and um, when my wife started going to this school, she came back with a new thing. She says that when I meet with her, I have to bath. Me, my knowledge tells me it's only when I meet with a prostitute that I take a bath. 
is that an educated father? Is that an educated husband? No. Okay, let's so, try and define education because you know, often when we talk about education, okay. often people also think literacy. Yes. They're thinking Western education is yes. where well, going to yeah, right. getting. So when you say what we need is education, can you be specific about what you're talking about? For parents, the education is for them to understand that being Muslim Christian influence or image over your life. the education of the cultural environment in which you exist. The second but that responsibility does not devolve power over the people we are dealing with. Because like you say, education has multiple facets. And we've got to understand it in its elastic um, form. When people say literacy in northern Nigeria, I, I deal with them. These people are noted in the Arabic, uh, in, in, in religious knowledge, don't call them illiterates. They may not be Western educated, but they are not illiterate. So, so Kadria, my point being this, that, that education that constructs cultural inhibitions is essential for parents. The education you are using my word, oh. <laughs> What? Deconstruction. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I never said it is wrong. <laughs> you see, when you talk to the kid, there is a certain way you see. The queen is not amused. You don't say the queen does not want to laugh. You don't say, you don't say, play to a psyche, that is you, play a new. I'm talking about language, communication. We need education that communicates between us and says to us, what is going on is wrong. Kadria, it took her up at four years. With four years research, which you can access on our website, to say to people, are we doing things right or not? And in 2009, I was privileged to host over 80 Chief judges, uh, what is happening in northern Nigeria at women is wrong, and that gave us the impetus to move on. And that has been put together by a group. say the injustice of a woman having to drink the water of a dead body's bath. I think you asked a question. You said what did, does education mean and um, I just wanted to say this. For me, education means um, basic, compulsory basic education and um, that for me is I'm sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm talking about every girl should have a right to compulsory basic education. And compulsory basic education is primary education from primary 1 to 6 plus JS 1, 2, and 3. That, is compuls that should be compulsory basic, and I believe it is by law. Um, so I think that we should just stick to that. We're in the 21st century. There's no way that the, child, the, the girl child can, can flourish in a situation where she only has uh, either Islamic education or cultural knowledge, she must have literacy. And later, if I have time, I'll tell you about literacy. Yes, and, and something I'm doing, some work I'm doing in this area. Thank you. Yeah. Well, in my own uh, case, I agree with uh, both speakers. Uh, but there's, there's what we call the behavioral change communication. I think that awareness before we even you know say that uh, the the for the girl child compulsory education first of all the parent needs to understand why it is so important to support the girl child education and so uh, the way to go for me is to engage in 
uh, you know, uh, sensitization and awareness creation. Uh, in all my work, I haven't done much work with regard to, um, uh, you know, um, Islamic um, uh, family, family law and all that, even though I studied it in the, in the university, you know, but in my work that I have done with the International Federation of Women Lawyers, we have come to realize that most of the, the challenges you know, are, are deepened because of lack of awareness. You know, when you don't know your rights, even when somebody is uh, stepping on them and, you know, doing whatever, you do not know there's anything wrong about it. Okay. I, so, I remember so, a situation yeah. where uh, we went to a particular community to do sensitization, and a woman stood up to say, we are not complaining. We love the situation that we find ourselves in. We love our men. We love what they are doing unto us. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, the, 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 so you need to uh, create the awareness for women to know that you, you, it can be better for you. So, so we, we are talking practical things now. Um, Mrs. Zuma has talked about ensuring that the girl child is educated and that education is compulsory, finding a way to, to ensure that that happens. Um, Mrs. Sadatumadi has talked about working with religious bodies that are respected and coming up with consensus about the way things should be and, and generally sharing that with communities through mediums that they respect and that they listen to. You've talked about sensitization campaigns. Um, we are in a state called Kaduna, and you know the role that um, politicians play and um, the, the, the things that um, they are supposed to do. So I'm asking again for practical um, response to, if we, if we wanted this, to sort of continue to grow. In addition to some of these things we've discussed, what else is needed? Um, we need to go for legislation. Okay. And the politicians are not courageous enough, and I can be quoted. They fear their votes. Yes. They steer away from sensitive issues. We must have legislation. And this legislation must recognize the commitments of Nigeria as a country, because it is not just a country of Muslims, it is a country of Muslims, Christians, and other faiths. So when a law is acceded to by Nigeria, the minimum is to respect its domestication, having gone and committed to it. The second thing about legislation is that it gives power to the weakest. In the absence of legislation or legal decrees that protect people or promote their rights, then there is no law for the abused and for the weak. The third thing about legislation is it also deconstructs, coming back to beg your word, it also deconstructs the notion of impunity, where people can do what they want to do and get away with it. So for me, the key next thing after education, and please I shall know, I will be doing a great disservice to the Nigerian young girl and particularly that of Northern Nigeria to limit her education to what you thought I said. Every girl in Northern Nigeria must get basic education. And this came up, now talking about legislation. In Jigawa 2009, the issue of age of marriage came up. And for two hours, this LTGs, imams and lot debated. And with each time, the failure to define the age was given to us that the Quran did not define an age. So we then went to into relative. So what does marriage, what is marriage? Marriage is first a contract. And you can only go into a contract and it is there in the Quran when you have the mental capacity to respect the obligations you have signed on to. You also can only go into marriage when you can physically and mentally take the responsibilities that come with it. Can we not use that as a benchmark? And then another argument came. Well, okay, so can we separate marriage from the responsibilities that is carries? Yes, the legitimacy of marriage, whether to a child in the stomach, is not in doubt. And that's why I went into a problem with the governor of Zanfara when we married that girl in Abuja. I said we respected the law by a senator of the Federal Republic where the Child Rights Act is in operation, he goes and defies it. Number two, if you are going to Zanfara to do his marriage, it is within the jurisdiction of an Islamic state. 
but it wasn't the marriage that we pay. It is not the marriage that women's rights activists are, are complaining about. It is the responsibilities that marriage beholds on people who enter it. And that these young girls do not have the capacity, mental, physical, or otherwise. And that the consequences that come out of it are not managed. The system has no room. Right now, I don't think in the whole of Kaduna State, even with the proactiveness of Madam Nasu, there is a formal shelter to receive women who are abused and sent out of their matrimonial homes at 2 a.m. Three reasons I give. Education, legislation, and then we must have zero tolerance to injustice. Okay. where the Constitution gives the states uh, exclusive um, responsibility for education, um, for basic education. Then we have the tertiary education being the responsibility of the federal government. Now, um, we also have the University Baker Education Fund, which is a UBEC, um, where we have the first line charge goes straight into the university agency, and the agency is supposed to work with states. So basically what I'm saying is that the state governments um, have a very important role in this. Um, the state governments, we must get them to go on a massive education campaign. Um, so this is one very important thing. And this has to be done um, uh, because there's a lot of funding available that is not being used. The second thing I want to address is the issue of teachers. You see, we don't have enough teachers, and teaching profession is a, is a prof teaching is a profession that can be used. It's it, it, you can kill many birds with one stone. Now, teachers, uh, a lot of um, girl child um, issues with parents sending their children to school is because they get molested by male principals, teachers, etc. So what we, in my opinion, if I were a governor, is that I would embark on a massive training for women to go into teaching. Even Islamically, teaching is, is, is permitted. So you would not be breaching any Islamic uh, convention. You would have, I would train teachers, women, and I would deploy them into primary schools. And that way we can encourage girls to go to school because they're safe. You know, they're, apart from the cultural constraints, which, you know, they want to marry them off. resolve that. We have to also resolve the fact that we don't have teachers and toilets and all those things that you know. So people in the audience joining this conversation. I'd like to quickly go back just to one last issue and then we I don't want us to run away from it because that's the that make women, you know, unable to do you know, all we need to do is First, most important way is to first of all have the political uh, Governance at the government at the at the federal government. Some of the structures, some of the policies. We have the gender policy of uh, two thousand and seven. That is.
uh, uh, 10% women involved. But the truth is that even with the legislation, we, we f will need political will. The, our leaders need to believe that, look, there are potentials in these women that we are ignoring. Ignoring the potentials that are in half of the population. It's like working with, you have, a, 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 you have two feet and you're working with uh, one. So does the campaign, Mrs. Madi, does the campaign then need to be one about enlightening self-interest? about making men understand that actually it is in their interest and the interest of their sons, if not their daughters, that women do well. Yes, it is, and I, I want to believe that we've had enough role modeling. The conflicts and the recession the family. Like I said earlier, household heads are now almost lopsided. Women as household heads. If they do not have the wherewithal to support families, we will go into further moral decadence and economic dependencies. But for me, the big picture is what I want to look at in terms of potential. And please permit me, um, I want to call you Beneza. Let Beneza Guta came to Nigeria in 2004 on the invitation of Mrs. Eradua. And that was a day that opened my eyes. She wanted to see Northern Nigerian women. And with, in the Arabia Center, there's a room that has capacity for about 200 people. In less than one hour, that room had no seats remaining. And these are all Northern Nigerian women. A lot of them PhD. So many qualifications, how do you remember? And I said, you know, we have this cadre sitting in homes, believing they don't have a contribution to make, and I gave it to them. A lot of them, almost 40% of them, are comfortable because they've made it, they're either married to well to do husbands or not. What are you giving back? Are you supporting WAPA or other, you know, nurse groups? So we need to point to the big picture. And I ask all our nurse, you converse that it is okay to marry of daughters at 12 years. Please, how many of you marry of your daughters at 12 years? None will answer you, even if this were all of them. So it is about the big picture. Is it me or is it all? And we need to have a dictum of from one to all. If I see it wrong to marry of Khadija, who is now going to fifth year medical college, my last child, <laughs> she won. <laughs> if I see it right to educate her, then I have an obligation to fight for the girl in Busanna. <laughs> and it is not by default, it is by design. You got the opportunity. So the big picture is for Kadria, Aisha, Saldetu, and Nawa, and everybody in this room to join the fight for the big picture to be painted. <laughs> we cannot be comfortable that our own children are in school. We've got to care for those who are out. Some of us can be teachers, and you don't have to go to a formal school. Right now, because of the moral decadence, because of the insecurity in some schools, mothers have turned to house teachers. There are women whose children don't go to formal schools now, because you can register online and do exam. So it means there is a potential for us to expand the educational line. Number two, the big picture says also men must take responsibility. If the Quran, if the Bible, if everything in culture devolves leadership to them, leadership is responsibility and also truthfulness. Is it okay for you to have slaves below you or to have helpers? Because when you educate your women, they are helpers. But you have a responsibility, even if they are Dangote's mother, you have a responsibility to clothe them, feed them, and care for their well being. And their well being includes education. Why would you deny them or allow your neighbor to deny his daughter education? No, go sweet with your dialogue with him. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, do you have a microphone on the floor somewhere? Um, we do. Excellent. Okay, so um, comments, questions. We don't have a lot of time. And I would want people to keep their comments as um, short as possible. I will have no hesitation 
of cutting people off if they go on and on. So let me just say that. Okay, we will do maybe three, come back to the panel, three, come back to the panel. Okay, so I'll point to three people. The lady um, at the far back over there, one. Oh, the mic is here. Okay, let's start from here then, if the mic is here from here. So let's do one, two, three, and then take the mic to the other side. So one, two, three. Please, when you make your comment or ask your question, can you tell us who you are? Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Mariam Awesu. So my question is, uh, and this is just for anyone who wants to answer on the panel, you know, from your first-hand experience, you know, fighting for the rights of women, especially in the North, do, ha, have you seen any change, positive change in the mindset of the oppressors, which are mostly the male and sometimes <laughs> the females too? Do you think there's a mindset change in a positive way? Thank you. The next person who raised their hand, please. Yes. Okay. My name is Muhammad Blaini. We've been more like talking about the oppressors. Now, the